We'd like to welcome our viewers to the lesson number 10 uh, in the quarterly. The title of the quarter is The New Covenant. And so we are going to be discussing the Sabbath school lessons for each day of this week from May 29 through June 4. And uh, we have uh, our experienced teacher, Debbie, who will be helping. She is going to be uh, doing uh, Monday and Tuesday. And uh, we have Steve, who is pinch hitting on short notice. He'll be doing Wednesday. And we have Pastor Gilbert, who is going to be doing Thursday. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our church, Steve is our head elder at uh, Corona Church. My name, again, is Chuck McKinstry, and I'm going to be the moderator this week, and I will be teaching Sunday's lesson. So I'd like to invite you to join me for a short prayer as we begin our study of the New Covenant this week. Father in heaven, we're grateful for the Bible and for the instruction that it provides us, for the stories that it tells us, for the insights that it gives us into your character and what you would have us to do. As we study the, these uh, words, Tonight, uh, as we study these passages tonight, we pray that your spirit will be with us as we record and will be with our viewers as they watch. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the first thing I wanted to do is um, talk just a little bit about the idea of the new covenant. The new covenant can be a confusing idea, the old covenant, the new covenant, which one's which, how are they different, etc. And so um, I don't think we would want to spend an awful lot of time on that, but I want to read a little bit from Exodus 24. Um, Verse 3, Moses came and told all the people the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So that's uh, the Mount Sinai uh, location. He'd been up on Mount Sinai, and he came back and had all of these instructions from the Lord. And their response was, uh, well, we'll do everything. We'll do exactly what he says. Of course, uh, we know that that didn't turn out too well. <laughs> so later, uh, there's a reference to a new covenant, and we'll be talking about that just in a little bit. Uh, the, the old covenant, though, as it's presented in Exodus, is more to uh, here are all the things you need to do, and then if you do them, I'll bless you. The new covenant, as we'll see, has a different element to it is it says, I will write my law in their hearts. That's quite a bit different than them just promising to do everything they're asked to do. So let's read Jeremiah, which is the, the key text for the Sunday lesson. And this is coming from Jeremiah 31 and it's verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming. I'm reading uh, from the New Revised Standard Version. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me 
from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. That's quite a change in direction from the way it's presented in Exodus. In the lesson, there are four questions that the author asks about the new covenant. Who instigates the new covenant? Well, it's the Lord, of course. Whose law is being talked about here? What law is this? So he's talking about um, the Lord's law, the new covenant. And which verse is stress of relational aspect that God wants with his people? Well, he says, I'm going to write my laws on their heart. So it's God doing that for us. What act of God on behalf of his people forms the basis of the covenant relationships? Well, that's basically the same thing I just said. I will put my law on their hearts and I'll write it. On, I put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. So in Exodus, God gave all the laws, he gave the Ten Commandments, and he gave a whole lot of other laws as well. And they became what is somewhat referred to as the Torah. The Torah, however, the quarterly talks about, uh, should be understood not just to mean law, but to mean instruction. But I think there is a considerable difference between Jeremiah's expression and the expression in Exodus where they're read what are the what God wants them to do and they say we will do them. In Jeremiah, God is quoting God as saying, I will write it on their hearts. So it's it's almost like the first instance is an experiment. Okay, so you're going to do everything I ask you to do. So here's what I want you to do. And they don't do it. And so by the time of Jeremiah, God's taking a different approach. Not that God doesn't know the end from the beginning, but he has a plan to how he does things. And maybe his plan is, well, I'll let them try to do that on their own. And when they realize it's just not going to work, then we'll work out a different plan. And that is, uh, I will write it on their hearts. And then in the quarterly for Sunday, it references Matthew 5, verses 17 to 28, which is a long passage. This is a passage where Jesus expands on the moral requirements of the law. I'd like to read some of this to you. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of letter of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it is said, this is verse 21, you've heard that it was said of ancient times, you shall not murder. And whoever marries shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And you say, if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go first be reconciled to your brother or sister. And then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court or with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into the prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. 
You have heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And these are not passages that we reconcile easily with the, current, with the character of Jesus as a loving, our loving uh, father, our loving, uh, loving Christ, the loving brother. These are, these are harsh statements that he's making. And um, did the Jesus who we regard as gentle Jesus, meek and mild actually say, say these things? But it even gets more challenging when he says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Now, that's pretty much a syntactic. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 one phrase cancels the other. <laughs> if you love your enemies, then you're not their enemies, right? So how do you love your enemies? Uh, you know, I think what happens when we read this and when the disciples heard it initially, they realized that these things are impossible to do. Just, you can't love your enemies, but he actually commands it. So there's not any wiggle room. He says, love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you, etc. Have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed for your enemies? Have you yeah. prayed for someone that you're upset about? Yeah. Prayed for someone who's wronged you? Yes. If you've done that, you know that it works, don't you? Yeah. And, and the person it works for is you. Yeah. It, it may not affect the other person at all. In fact, if you went and told him, I've been praying for you, he might just hit you. <laughs> Because he said, you're praying for me to go to hell, aren't you? <laughs> you know, but when you do that on your own, I know I had a person that had wronged me seriously, actually had sued me. And, uh, you know, I couldn't think about that person without being angry. And I found that uh, praying for that person helped resolve that anger. It's pretty hard to pray for someone that, you know, and be angry at the same time. Unless you do it like David did on occasion. Lord, water the ground with their blood. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's the kind of prayer Jesus is requesting in this circumstance. The new covenant is where God writes the laws in our hearts. The kind of love expressed in the second half of Matthew 5 can only be achieved by God writing his law in our hearts. So I think the answer to these uh, expansions of in Matthew 5 that Jesus gives, you know, regarding anger, regarding divorce, regarding all these things, I think the answer to them is that the only way you can live and, and function doing those things is uh, when God writes his law in our hearts. So we actually want to do those things. It, it's not a struggle. We want to do them because we want to do the right thing. So with that, I conclude my comments for the Sunday's lesson. If there's any questions or follow up any of you would like to do to that, let me know or, or speak up now or we'll just we'll move on. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Debbie, uh, you're going to have Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes, thank you so much, Attorney McKinstry. What a wonderful introduction for this lesson as we continue to ponder how God pursues us. I can't help but remember the text. And I've said it before when 
teaching and earlier lessons, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul pants after me, after thee, I should say. And we see a God who is relentless about having a relationship with his people. This lesson for Monday is so interesting because it is clear that what God has put before the people has been said before. And here we see the Israelites are about to go into captivity, the Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah is speaking words as a prophet now. And the lesson references a span of 150 years since Hosea had referenced the same thing where there were words that were stated to the people and now it's coming through a prophet. Same God, same desire. If you don't mind, I'd like to see if you would allow me to phrase it in this context. I believe we're dealing strictly with matters of the heart. As Attorney McKinstry stated, writing the word upon our hearts. It's when the heart is moved that we seem to respond at our best. If we give our whole heart to our job, to our relationships, they seem to function well. If we put it all on the table, it seems as though those type of relationships have the best chance of surviving because their foundation is secure. But when matters of the heart are unsolved, when there is something still pending and there's restlessness and anger and shiftlessness, then there seems to be a problem with the heart. And it seems to come out in a number of ways, rebelliousness, disobedience, conniving dispositions, strategizing to hurt one another. And I believe that's what God witnessed in the Israelites. They had been out of the wilderness after having been removed from Egypt. We know they didn't make it. And then here it is, they're still not in a relationship where they're willing to put God first. Isn't that what we experience sometimes with our own relationships right now? within our families, within our business associates. I'm sorry to say, even at church, if there's a disagreement within the board, our business meeting, or you're not voted into an office because your tenure is completed for your time in office and someone else is put in, it could be that your heart is broken or you're hurt. And somewhere in your heart, it's disturbed and you begin to build up animosity and pain, clearly a matter of the heart. In the early 1900s, two brothers had experienced a lot of success. In fact, they had done quite well. It was clear that they were going to be a really good success story. They were diligent. They work well together. They were considerate of one another. And even after they got married and began to have their families, everyone could see that it was clear they were loving brothers. Adolf, Adolf was very clear that he loved his brother Rudolph. And to their surprise, when a runner who participated in the Olympics took off in one of their pair of shoes, it took off in a big way for their business. And they began to do very, very well. But then the war came and they found themselves having to respond to that. Rudolph was doing well, but came point to the time where he had to join with the other brother. And the brother came home and he made an off the cuff comment that didn't seem to go over too well. In fact, the interpretation of the comment, it is believed, is really what's started the discord between the brothers and what want, what was once a loving relationship between brothers now was divided. The foundation was cracked and they found out that that foundation was not infallible. In fact, they vowed 
they would not ever work together again. They distanced themselves as far as they could, one on the East and one on the West. True story. Realizing they both had a talent for shoes, having been made popular by the athlete whose name was Jesse Owens. They really were beyond their return, so they thought. And all the family, unfortunately, whether they liked it or not, were all affected by the decision to be rebellious and entertain this discord. One brother went to one side and decided he would use his nickname, 80, and start another business. The other brother decided he would use some initials from his name, and he started the same business with a different name. Would you believe those names are now household names for us? But you would never know that the background of this company is filled with strife and discord. And do I dare say it, matters of the heart. Just in case you're wondering who I'm speaking of, I'm speaking of Puma. Puma, the tennis shoe and the other shoe named after Adolf, 80, his nickname, last name Dessler or Dassler. And that became Adidas. And while we know those are popular names in the world of athletes and performance for runners and athletes alike, the discord, would you believe, followed them to their death as it is recorded. The disobedience and the rebelliousness and the discord of those families extended way beyond them. And what may have been valued as a relationship that one would never cross is clearly broken at the root of their foundation when one allowed something to creep in because the heart seemingly was no longer there, no longer committed. Or how about this, another organization, that was an organization that had discord, but another organization of a different ilk. They were started in the 1700s. They were known as Jolly Corks, an interesting group. You see, they came together for one purpose, and that was to separate themselves from the main thread of society, away from all of the family members and so forth, mostly men, where they could get together and have their favorite alcoholic beverage. This one actually grabs my attention very, very closely because you see, they strategize. They found a place that was set aside off the beaten path and they get together there and have their conversations and so forth until they realized they couldn't do it on the Sabbath. Even back then, the Sabbath was at the forefront. I'm gonna come back to that particular group because you see, they had an understanding, a covenant between them, one that could not be broken if you wanted to be a member. There are a number of groups that require membership. I'm sure you thought of some of them. Some of you are actually members of them. Did you know that the AAA organization is actually a nonprofit of which you can be a member. Perhaps you, like me, have a AAA card and you know that there are certain requirements to be a member. Or how about a member of a credit union? You're not just an individual depositing money, but you're actually a member of a group. Or how about some of these unusual groups such as the group of wives who have band together in India to teach other wives how to conduct themselves and keep their marriages on a scale of one to 10, a 10. Could you believe that the most conservative women that we think of are actually doing that? And I wouldn't dare want to disappoint you with discussions that might be a little bit kinky, but I can assure you it is a real organization. Or how about the organization that is specifically for those who are not dead? Yes, I did say not dead. And it may not be quite what you think. 
You see, a man had a relative that declared him legally dead. He didn't realize it. And when he tried to engage in business, it wasn't accepted. He realized year after year, and yes, I did say years, that he was not able to function as a living person. His rights had been suspended. And he tried hard, feverishly, to try to be arrested, to try to be seen, to have an infraction that would be against his wife so that there would be proof, yes, I'm here. But this is during a day when there wasn't DNA testing and so forth. And so he had quite a struggle. Come to find out his relative did that because he wanted his share of his inheritance. And back then, only a man could do that in his particular family. So he started an organization for those who had been compromised because someone in the family had declared them dead. Would you believe last date they checked? He had over 35 active members who were experiencing the same problem. And how long did it take him to prove that he was not dead? Would you believe through the membership of his own organization, through all of his time in court, following all of those laws, 17 years? And yet what came out of that was the ability to join an organization. I'm sure there are other organizations that you might be familiar with. In fact, not too long ago, if someone sent me in the mail something that was totally unsolicited, it was one of those AARP cards. I said, whoa, wait a minute, I'm not ready for that. Why are you starting to send that to me now? Aren't you a few years off? But that's a big membership an organization, and all of them have guidelines, rules, and regulations to comply with. And when you abide by it, you get the best benefit that they can offer. Isn't that what Christ is seeking when he came here to tabernacle and fellowship with the individuals that he walked with, disciples and the communities that he visited, to show that there was a way for us to live with his word, his father's word on our heart. And even when our heart is not what it should be, when we go through all of the different matters of the heart that we go through, anger and jealousy and all those other things that are so unlike Christ, even in that, his heavenly father still loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. But it still seems to be very clear. It's a matter of the heart. I love the way the lesson on Monday referenced what would happen if someone came to you and asked you, how do I get a new heart? I checked into some of the discussions having to do with the heart. In 1907, there was an individual by the name of Simon. He believed that in just a short period of time, there would be the opportunity to take a heart from one human to another human and do a transplant. He was innovative way back then in 1907. It wasn't until 60 years later that in South Africa and the UK, they did what was considered to be the first heart transplant. I'd like to think that that's what God is seeking with us. Put away your old ways and those habits that are causing you to be separated from me. And why not consider a heart transplant, a new heart, a new way of living, a new way of thinking. And while you're doing that, remember that I'm not putting you aside and I'm not casting you aside because I'm disappointed with you because you haven't been doing what I asked you to do. I'm still the same God. I still love you. I still sent my son to die for you. But you've got to comply with what it is that I put out for you because you see, I created you and I know what's best. I couldn't help but think that sounds similar to a parent. When a parent is trying to lead and direct a child to make good sound decisions. And every now and then a child steps outside of that peripheral 
and they make their own decisions. Well, as I close, I'd like to get back to that organization, the Jolly Corks. The Jolly Corks were an interesting group. They came together and they later became known as the Elks, but they found out that it wasn't gonna continue to go well if they continued to do so, taking a, partaking of alcohol and then going against what they call the Christian Sabbath. Christian Sabbath, or IE, as the author has stated in this story, Sunday. And by the way, you'd like to perhaps know that some of the members of this group have been former presidents, senators, speakers of the House, entertainers like Jack Benny and Clint Eastwood. They've all been a part of this. But the guidelines and parameters are very clear. Even though they've been benevolent and they've been charitable, they still have their guidelines on how you are able to become a member. And that's what I see in our Tuesday's lesson. There's still, still certain things in the covenant that God would like for us to honor. It's not so much that the old covenant wasn't working, but the new covenant still with the same individual gives us an opportunity to see who we are when we put our hearts in his, his hand. Can I end with Hebrews I'm sorry, not Hebrews, Isaiah 56, 6. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servant. Everyone who kept the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house. This is a matter of the and when we give our hearts wholeheartedly to God, then he in turn can enter into that covenant relationship with us that he longs to have with us. And then we will experience the ultimate that he would have for us to experience. I hope that you like me continuously seek the ultimate relationship with God, because then you see when we do that, the promises that he has in his word for us are ours for the asking. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford to miss any promises that he's intended for the betterment of my good. I hope that that little token of time that we spend together with matters of a heart will encourage you in your walk with Christ. Thank you, Debbie, very nicely done. You have some very interesting illustrations for your lesson today. Thank you. So we're going to move on to uh, Wednesday's lesson, and our our pinch hitter, Steve, will be uh, filling in for Isaac, who was unable to uh, to make it to the recording. But Steve is going to come in and do Wednesday a better covenant. All right. Uh, thank you, Chuck. Debbie, I love that. Um, I was thinking as you were telling the story about the club, I was thinking of the AARP. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, take that back, take that That's back. right, <laughs> that's right, that's right. Not me, no. <laughs> oh, that was that was very good, very good, Debbie. Thank you. Um, Wednesday's lesson is um, about obviously the new covenant, but talking about the new covenant as being the better covenant. And so we're going to take a look at a few uh, uh, verses of scripture and uh, a few other things. Um, and, uh, and, and that will cover Wednesday. You know, something that Debbie said that um, we mustn't um, forget is that this first covenant, the one that Chuck was talking about, the one that was in Exodus, it wasn't bad, but it was broken. It was broken. 
and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, if uh, you could turn in your Bibles uh, to Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to just look at verse 6. The author of Hebrews writes in chapter 8, verse 6, but now he has ordained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. And so we're going to take a look at what makes this covenant better and what makes these better promises. You know, in, in, in Greek, there are two meanings for the word new. Now, there are two different uh, words that are used. One of the words is neos. And that meaning signifies that it is new in respect of time. So it is new in respect of time. That is, it's recent. It happened recently. So it's new. The second meaning is the word kanos, which means it's new as to the quality of. And that's really what we're talking about when we use the word new covenant. It's not new in time. It is new on quality. On quality. Now, in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, talked about the better covenant and better promises. And so Chuck took a look at Exodus chapter 24, but we can even look before uh, Exodus chapter 20, where we find the Ten Commandments. And that's found in Exodus chapter 19, starting with, starting with verse 3. Moses went up to God. He went up to Mount Sinai. And the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Verse 7, so Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded them. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So there's an agreement. That's what a covenant is. A covenant is an agreement. And the people are the one making the promises. The people are the ones that are, are, are see the ordinances. They see the law. They see what, the, what God has said. Said, yep, we're going to do that. Yep, and that's not a problem. We will keep these laws. We will keep these ordinances. We will keep these statutes. The people are making the promise. But already we read in Jeremiah and and we can also find in Hebrews chapter 10 and chapter 8, actually, as well, that the promises now are coming from God, not from the people. You know, last quarter, we studied the book of Isaiah. And so a quick, quick review of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 57, I find a very interesting um, a writing from Isaiah. He is writing the words of the Lord. He, is, he says that time and time again in the book, that this is the word of the Lord. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm not even going to read many of the verses here. But know that in chapter 57, he is writing about how Israel's idolatry is futile. He is writing how they're worshiping the wrong things. They are doing the wrong things. They are sacrificing the wrong things. Really, really terrible things are recorded in chapter 57. 
And in chapter 57, verse 7 through 10, you hear a longing of God that he so much desires to be with his people, but they are with another. Use graphic language of you have set your bed. You have uncovered yourself to someone else. Graphic language. God is aching to be with his people. Now, you would think that after all of these things, because let's face it, God is God. He's powerful. That because of all of the iniquity, all of the just terrible things the people are doing, God is going to wash his hands and say, Enough of this, I am done. But note in verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy places with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry for the spirit who failed before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him. I hid and was angry, and he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him and to his mourners. Oh, my goodness. Here is a God who is saying a contrite heart. A contrite heart. I am willing to forgive. I want to redeem you. Come back to me. That is the new covenant. That is the new and better promises of what we are, what this lesson is all about. Debbie talked about this heart in this, in these verses. It talks about a heart, her heart. And so this new covenant, it is the grace that God provides. And it is our response to that grace. And Isaiah calls it a contrite heart. God does not treat us as we deserve. Amen. You know, um, I can't help but think of a time when way back between the sophomore and junior year in high school where I accepted this gracious and loving offer of the covenant making God to forgive me of my sins and to give me this new heart. I, you know, my testimony is not uh, one that, uh, that uh, brings people to tears <laughs> or anything like that. You know, I grew up in the church Went to Avenue schools, never did anything that was seen to be bad, such as I'm talking about drugs and alcohol or anything like that. Didn't do that. But it doesn't matter. We all need a savior. And I was doing some things for the church, doing this, doing that. And I was working with a, a summer youth pastor down in San Diego. And we were actually going to go out and give Bible studies. And for whatever reason... It just hit me. Here I am going out and give Bible studies, but I haven't been baptized. I haven't fully given my heart to Jesus. <laughs> How crazy is that? And so I marched into the pastor's office and said, I'm ready to be baptized. I am ready to be baptized. And ever since, it's been a journey. A journey with, with, with God. Certainly, there have been, um, I have failed along the way, but 
it is by God's grace that I continue to travel with him. Amen. I encourage you, the listener, those who are viewing this, to consider when you accepted this gracious offer of this new covenant, this grace that God is inviting you to accept. To think about that time in your life. And to pause and to thank God. Perhaps you are viewing this with a loved one or, or with your children. Share your story with them. Share your story. Because it is your story of how God has worked in your life. Perhaps there are others who are watching this who have never given them their lives to Jesus. For whatever reason. I encourage you to do so today because this new covenant, this better covenant made on better promises is for all. Mm -hmm. Does not matter where you've been, what you have done. God is seeking you today. Amen. If you want help with that, Please contact our church, contact Pastor Gilbert, uh, email the church, and we'll be happy to work with you as you commit your life to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I almost was going to call you Pastor Steve there for a minute. <laughs> well, you did make an altar call, didn't you? Yes, he did. <laughs> well, that was very nice, though. And definitely from the heart. So we're going to finish our week's study with Thursday. The New Covenant Priest and uh, Pastor Gilbert will be leading out in that. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Debbie. It's an incredible lesson so far. Thank you so much for everybody's presentation. Thursday, real quick, it says, uh, the title of the lesson is The New Covenant Priest. The New Priest. The first paragraph in the, the lesson on Thursday, it says, The book of Hebrews places a heavy emphasis on Jesus as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. This is now a little bit of the language of the Old Testament. The priest and the high priest and the holy and the most holy place. A place of an offering and many different kind of animals. But, you know, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, like John the Baptist pointed out when he saw Jesus. What is interesting in the New Covenant priest is that the book of Hebrews put an emphasis that Jesus Christ himself is the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. The lesson reminds us that in the Old Testament, all those services, all those sacrifices, they centered in sacrifices and this word mediation, People would receive forgiveness for their sins, coming into the old tabernacle, the old sanctuary, offering an animal, many different kinds, kinds of animals, in order to receive forgiveness for their sins. The lesson goes on to say that many animals were slain, and the blood was what mediated people and the priest for their sins to be forgiven. These were symbols of salvation before Jesus. And the lesson here reminds us in Hebrew chapter 10, verse 4. Hebrew chapter 10, verse 4. It says, For it is impossible for the blood of animals, the blood of bulls and goats, to take away sins. Quite a shift from the Old Testament because everything was about the sacrifice of the animals. And now you see in the New Testament saying, yeah, no, no, no. The sacrifice of those animals would not do it. It says here in the lesson that all of these sacrifices 
the priest and the high priest, the holy place, the most holy places, place, you know, all those emblems and symbols, they pointed out to one person. And all of that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ became the ultimate sacrifice. When I was a Bible teacher, many kids would ask, why do you pray in the name of of Jesus yeah. is because he is the ultimate sacrifice. When we pray in the name of Jesus, it's almost like we are offering Jesus as the sacrifice so we can be saved, so we can receive salvation, redemption, and forgiveness. The true sacrifice, Jesus Christ, had been made once for all. Hebrews chapter 9 Verse 46. What a beautiful Bible verse. And then in the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 51. Matthew 27, verse 51. There's a question right here in the middle of the lesson that says, read Matthew 27, 51, which tells how the veil in the earthly sanctuary was torn when Jesus died. How does that event help us to understand that the earthly sanctuary had been superseded. Look at this Bible verse in Matthew 27. And it says here, And behold, the curtain of the temple at the time of the death of Jesus Christ, and the ultimate sacrifice was made. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to the bottom. And the earth shook. And the rocks were split. Oof. The holy place is now open. We can go straight into the most holy place in the very presence of God through Jesus Christ. And that's why we pray in the name of Jesus. We don't need a mediator in this earth. Amen. We need a pastor or an elder or a priest. When we pray, when we New before the Lord, we can go straight before the throne of grace. Amen. Lord Christ, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. Beautiful Bible verses that reminds us that uh, only by mentioning the name of Jesus, we will be saved and have eternal life. Isn't that beautiful? When we remember the story of uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, the, the angels were coming and approaching, or the angel is coming and approaching planet Earth, you know, to open and roll that tomb. The soldiers, they just fall like dead, man, in the presence of one mighty angel of the Lord. Can you imagine now? The Bible says there are thousands and thousands and millions of millions of angels. The very presence of Jesus, the name of Jesus. John the Baptist says, you cannot baptize me. I'm not worthy, not even to untie your sandals. But Jesus says, let's fulfill the prophecy. Let's fulfill what's being said about, about me. Jesus Christ is the new covenant priest. Our straight access all the way to the throne of God when we pray. The lesson ends here by saying that everything that had been fulfilled in Jesus is now ministered to his blood in the heavenly sanctuary. The book of Hebrew stresses Christ as the high priest in heaven, having entered by shedding his own blood. Hebrews 9 verse 12 that says he entered once for all into the holy place. Let me read this again. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. The name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus said that when I'm lifted up, I'm going to attract to me the whole world. 
He is our new covenant priest. The lesson ends by saying, how does it make you feel understanding that even now Jesus is ministering his blood in heaven on our behalf? How much confidence and assurance does that give you regarding your salvation? It's not about what we do. It's not about what we give. It's all about what he has done. It's all about what he has given. The sacrifice is available to all. All of those who believe. Amen. So Chuck, I you back to you, my time here, reminding us that uh, this is the new covenant, the new priest, Jesus Christ, the one that uh, represents once for all our sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Gilbert. It's a good way to end our study for the week. Would you uh, be kind enough, Pastor Gilbert, to uh, close with a prayer for us? Of course. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world, the one who said that anyone who calls upon his name will be saved and have eternal life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, where the book of Hebrews says that he lives to intercede for every single one of us. Father, once again, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Father, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit upon your church, upon our families, also upon every single one of those who are watching today. Like Steve said, if anyone still needs to give their lives to Christ, Father, we want to be instruments of your grace to help them. Father, we thank you for your word that says that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And it is in the name of our covenant priest that we pray, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you all your listeners, for all our listeners for joining us and thank you for each of our pre presenters tonight. Thank you.